Um, so, um, but somehow, so all every every kind of notion of rock and roll was like swept from my from my life. Um, but somehow, country was okay. So, like in Chicago, there was a really good country station, and I think it was maybe because my mom was raised on country, like. In that, in my grandmother's house, it was like the country station got turned on the minute someone woke up, and it was the last thing to go off before before people went to bed. You know, so um, somehow country was okay, and my mom said, you know, oh, if country's okay, it's about life. So, you know, I guess life was not satanic. <laughs> it was just life. So, um, but you know, so. I was just a country fanatic growing up, so I listened to country and classical, and there were a few Christian contemporary songwriters that I was like, okay, this is good music. This is like pretty good music, you know? Otherwise, it was like, it's pretty bad. Um, and then when I went to college, so, so my ideas around race and music were just like, well, I'm obviously, don't, I don't look like a country singer, you know? Um, I don't know how I would ever be a country singer, but it's what I, it, it was where my heart was in terms of the music that I loved. Um, and then um, I kind of escaped, you know, I escaped to college um, through, I, I think, a miracle, you know, just like I applied to every single school I could think of. I mean, I, I really over applied. I think I applied to 50 schools. I was like, just get me to the East Coast. <laughs> um, and somehow, you know, a school accepted me on the East Coast. I was like, I'm going. I don't care how much it costs. I don't care how much it does. I mean, I'm still, you know, paying off these loans. I don't care. I cannot take my education away from me. So um, in college, all of a sudden, people are introducing me to rock and roll. And that's where I kind of, um, you know, just got schooled in Neil Young and Bob Dylan and, you know, things that I guess I should have known about, you know, decades. Yeah, they were, they were satanic. <laughs> um, my, 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 uh, my relationship with Satan is a whole different story. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, then, you know, once I joined Earl Grey on, I mean, I came to New York to be a songwriter and met Matt White, my bandmate, and he kind of introduced me to Led Zeppelin then, and we sang together, and he was like, can you learn to play bass in my band? And I was like, yeah, I'll learn to do anything, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then it was like, oh, we are rocking, oh, <laughs> oh you know, I, um, and then he was, you know, you know, on some, some day, there was this moment where it was like, can you sing a little louder? And I was like, you know, it was just like, it came out, and I was like, oh, I can do that. You know, it was a really amazing moment. Um, I'm sure that didn't sound, that was not as uh, musical as I was. He was a fit of singing. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I was, yeah I, was, I was giving you the moment of like strangled, um, strangled discovery. Um, but then, you know, as, uh, and as Earl Graham kind of progressed, I don't think, I don't really think we thought about race until we got to that record label stage, which was also its, its own moment, because the music business was really changing a lot as we kind of hit our, you know, just like we're taking off. Um, and all these people that we would meet with, they were just like, we don't know what to do with you. And I was like, really? I think audiences actually are cool with this. Like, are you really like saying this to me? Because um, it just seems so backward. In yeah, it was like well, 2006, but still, I mean, it was it was so obvious that audiences did not have this issue, and that it was just these people who were scared to take risks um, and scared to not know how to market something. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of um, where we, where it definitely gave me pause. But I really didn't think about it until, until that moment. I was like, oh, like this is gonna stop like what we're doing somehow. 
Um, I'll just stop there. So that's what that's what it felt like. It was just like, oh, I guess we have to do it on our own, which in our mythology and in, in rock and roll mythology, which is which is its own, you know, conversation that I'll touch on. Um, there's this mythology that you need these people, and I don't think as rockers we had really worked through that mythology yet. When we got to that moment, it was like it was the idea of like, oh, we can just do this on our own. We don't need these people. We can we can just address our audience right as they are. There, there was still this like fortress of the mythology of it, which is like, no, you rock out, somebody finds you, then they give you a lot of money, and then you just like sit in the back of your limousine, coked up, and like play rock and roll, you know, it's like, and you know, and somebody steals your money, and that's okay, and, uh, you're famous, you know, it's like, um, the, so, you know, <laughs> Um, there was just that, that fortress of mythology that we, we really had to get over. And I think, you know, we're on hiatus now, but I think that's, it's part of us kind of letting go of that mythology and for myself starting to really engage my music without needing a middle man, you know. Um, I think younger generations of musicians are not having this problem at all, you know, but I was. I think um, it's complicated a little bit by genre for me because um, I'm operating in, in jazz and I'm operating in R&B and I'm operating in rock and I'm operating in electronic music and... Um, well, do, do me a favor, I mean, talk about the journey, man, because I knew you as an avant you were, you were like this young, badass avant-garde drummer. You played with David Ware for about, I want to say 10 years, is that what Just about 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the longest, <laughs> longest any drummer yeah. ever lasted. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but if you listen to David and you um, trace the um, history of the political sound that he's making, and I, came up, I grew up listening on, on, all, on all those streams of jazz, hip hop, R&B, rock, electronic music, and dealing with all of that. And if you listen to David, and you grow up also listening to Bad Brains and Public Enemy, then you realize that, oh, my Bad Brains just distorted the fusion stuff that they were doing before that. So it's honestly, it's really the same, the same thing. David didn't necessarily know what I was using, um, but you know, 